Hello, good evening uh, everybody and welcome to the ESOT webinar regarding monitoring of CMV infection in transplant recipient. Uh, I am Luciano Potena and I'm going to uh, moderate this uh, webinar together with uh, Nassim Kamar. So uh, thank you again for your participation and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce my co-moderator uh, Nassim Kamar and uh, very few uh, housekeeping uh, remarks for the next uh, hour or so. Uh, everybody who is uh, attending uh, can uh, answer, uh, can uh, ask questions uh, by using the Q&A um, icon, which should be uh, underneath your screen or up in your screen, depending on uh, uh, your browser and depending on your operating system. Um, and uh, uh, we will hear um, Tiziana Lazzarotto uh, uh, talking us about the uh, importance of uh, um, in uh, uh, CMV monitoring in clinical practice and Martina Zester uh, talking about CMV specific immunological monitoring. Uh, I would like uh, to thank MSD as a partner for this CMV work stream and I will give the uh, word to uh, Nassim Thank you, Luciano. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's really my pleasure to participate in this ESOT webinar dedicated to CMV. Uh, we are a small number of uh, people who worked on this webinar, so I would like to thank everybody again. And uh, we have a very interesting topic dealing with the monitoring of CMV in transplant patients. And the first talk will be given by Tiziana Lazzarotto, which is professor of microbiology and clinical microbiology at the University of Bologna. She is also the head of the virology laboratory. Her talk will be uh, the virological monitoring of CMV infection, the current tools and their use in clinical practice. And afterwards, we'll move to uh, Mar uh, Martina Sester. So let's move to the first talk. And uh, Tiziana, thank you very much for your talk. We are hearing your expertise. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your patience and thank you for the invitation. Thank you to the, the, the referee. Okay. And, uh, and uh, today, currently, we have uh, two possible uh, approaches uh, um, designed to prevent uh, CMV infection diseases uh, and uh, recommending transplant patients. Regardless of the approach used, the patients must be monitored with efficient, sensitive and quantitative uh, molecular assay. So uh, today we are going uh, in the first part to discuss uh, three different very, uh, very critical points. In particular, the first is the quantification. The quantification during uh, monitoring of CMV in a post-transplant period, the quantification is a CMV, CMV DNA is a cornstone. In most centers, especially in Europe, rely on preventive treatment strategies as a standard of care using DNA monitoring as biological parameters for treatment mutation. However, major critical points uh, among the different uh, centers uh, in testing methods, uh, in particular type of blood samples, uh, frequency and uh, uh, thresholds. These this, uh, very important points is, um, they are very important uh, in order to begin uh, the branch therapy. And uh, these points sometimes are obstacles for a standardized diagnostic and therapeutic approach. The first question, this is a very important question, old question, and uh, probably it is an international question. Which type of blood matrix should be tested? Whole blood or plasma during the virological monitoring in post-transplant period? 
Here I reported uh, uh, the, the last uh, international consensus guidelines and uh, both uh, documents uh, uh, recommended that uh, whole blood and plasma are uh, the best, uh, are uh, both uh, able for the detection of CMV uh, replication by molecular in the peripheral blood. And uh, however, in, uh, uh, in our documents, uh, we published these documents uh, in 2019, and uh, it uh, was uh, a multidisciplinary consensus conference uh, by three Italian uh, scientific societies. The first, uh, GITMO, uh, it is uh, the uh, Hematopoietic Stem Cell Transplant Society, CITO Organ Transplant Society, and AMCLI. AMCLI is the Society of uh, Clinical, Italian Clinical Microbiologists. So, and uh, in uh, our uh, document, uh, uh, we indicated that uh, the whole blood anemia should be preferred for gain preemptive treatment because plasma anemia might be persist despite uh, an uh, adequate uh, viral control, induce an appropriate antiviral treatment extension. So we know that uh, in matrix, in a whole blood matrix, uh, we can identify copies of DNA, complete variants and cells. Whereas in matrix plasma, we can identify uh, copies of DNA and variants, and complete variants. So in 2014, uh, the uh, Italian group, uh, working group on infections in transplant, the name is GLIT, decided to, uh, to, uh, to carry out, to carry out uh, an, uh, a retrospective non-interventional multicenter cohort study. And uh, the uh, aim was uh, to analyze the kinetics of CMV and EBV in whole blood and plasma sample from transplant recipients. So here I reported the result that we published just this year in August. And uh, in this, uh, uh, in this um, paper, we analyzed, uh, the, uh, we investigated the kinetics uh, ascending and descending phases of CMV DNA in whole blood plasma samples collected from adult kidney transplant recipients. So we published, uh, we published uh, in 2018, sorry, in 2018, uh, uh, the same, uh, uh, the same, very similar study that uh, we uh, have uh, had in uh, um, allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, and in both population organ and allogenic hematopoietic stem transplantation, we obtain very, uh, very similar results. So in the last publication, we analyzed the 328 part samples from 42 episodes of CMV infection by a single commercial molecular method approved by a regulatory agency for both matrices. As you can see here, I reported the regression an analysis of CMV DNA levels in whole blood and plasma. And uh, uh, here, as you can see here, we observe a very good correlation between CMV DNA levels in plasma and uh, in whole blood. When we analyzed the result that we obtained during the episode of act infection, in particular during the ascending and descending phases, we observe a very particular uh, uh, result. Um, in particular, and, uh, before reaching the peak, uh, when during acute phase we have uh, at zero uh, time the peak, and before this peak, CMV DNA levels were consistently higher in whole blood than in plasma, producing similar linear slopes. On the contrary, 
in the descending phase, viral load values in a whole blood progressively approach those the plasma. And as a result, the whole blood slope was steeper than the plasma slope. And uh, we continuous our study, analyzed the, uh, the, the, act, the episode of act infection in 29 patients who received the antiviral therapy during the first episode of act infection. As you can see here in these slides, in the slope, the, the ascending phase uh, the, um, for, uh, of the CMV DNA load in whole blood and in plasma were similar in treated and in non-treated patients with viral load constantly higher in whole blood. Whereas in the, the descending phase, slope were very similar in non-treated patients, while in a treated patient, in the patient who received the primary therapy, the slope very quickly converged because of a steeper decline of viral load in whole blood. The same, uh, um, the same aspect we uh, had when we analyzed the, uh, the, peak, uh, the peak of the, um, of the sorry, the percentage of peaks for a patient who received uh, or who did not receive the therapy. As you can see here, at uh, one week after the peak, we observed a decrease of CMV DNA levels of 76.7% in whole blood versus 67.1% in plasma. The same difference we observed at two weeks after the peak and three weeks after the peak. No statistically significant we observed in patients did not receive primary therapy. Finally, uh, if the monitoring had been performed only in plasma, in the 72.4% of cases, 21 out of 29 patients, the treatment interruption would be being de delayed seven, four, 14 days due to the residual plasma CMV DNA in signals. In particular, none of these patients developed a relapse or infection during the post-transplant period. So, these, uh, these results uh, also are also in agreement with the uh, uh, data published from uh, a Canadian group. And the Canadian group analyzed uh, 103 plasma samples obtained from uh, solid organ transplant, transplant recipients during active phase of CV infection. And this study concluded that the CMV DNA in organ transplant plasma is almost exclusively free DNA, highly fragmented and not variant associated. In the conclusion, the determination of CMV DNA in both blood matrices was able to provide univocal information on the kinetics of viral replication. The second, the identification of the primary therapy cutoff was safe to use for both whole blood and plasma. The third point is a critical point because CMV DNA was found from one to three weeks after the CMV DNA peak only in patients who receive primary therapy and only in plasma samples. And in 72.4% of patients receiving antiviral therapy, and could delay treatment interruption by seven to 14 days if you use the plasma, the anemia for the monitoring of CMV after the transplantation. So another point, another point of recommendation, and this recommendation, it, uh, it is reported from all consensus documents. It is highly recommended that only one specimen type be used when serially monitoring patients. So 
Now, uh, now let's analyze the, the problem for the, uh, for the user, how the results should be reported, copies or international unit. All international documental of consensus recommended to use the international unit per ML instead of DNA copies. And here I show you our um, another uh, manuscript, another work from, uh, from the working, Italian working group. And uh, we, in this study, we um, identify a different fact, conversion factor from copies to international unit for the normalization of CMB DNA load using the first WHO international standard. And the, 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 the topic of this study is we, we uh, work it with, uh, with uh, diff 11 different uh, laboratories throughout Italy. Pay close attention because uh, this year uh, in 2020, the group from Atlanta, Hayden, Randy Hayden, and Angela Caliendo uh, suggested that uh, sometimes it seems it's impossible to have a uh, harmonization of the results between the different laboratories. Uh, also when the laboratories uh, use commercial kits. The study confirmed that the negative impact of amplicon sites and the target fragmentation on commutability for CMB. And this is a result, a very important result because it's very important to analyze which kits, commercial kits, we use during our, uh, during the monitoring of CMB infection after transplantation, and which is the amplicon site and the target and the fragmentation of the target. And uh, for the timing, finally, for the timing, uh, which, which is the timing that we suggest for genemia uh, monitoring. And uh, the timing depends from the current condition of infection risk of the recipients. In particular, in standard risk, we suggest that uh, the anemia should be determined at least once a week in the first and once every other week in the second trimester and once every month for one year. Pay close attention in high risk uh, transplant patient for example, with primary infection during anti-rejection. And in other situations, it's very important to intensify the, of the monitoring schedule. Finally, finally, this is not the best question, but is a very old question, which is the cutoff of CMBD anemia. And currently, institutional rules vary greatly, especially in, so, in solid organ transplantation. The threshold of viral blood for the beginning of a preemptive therapy may not be decided on the basis of experimental evidence. So it is an agreement from all uh, international consensus guidelines. In our guideline, the panel agree and suggested for uh, organ transplantation a possible cutoff whole blood possible cutoff is 100,000 copies per ml or plasma uh, or in plasma 10,000 copies per ml. So I would like for your attention and uh, at the same time I would like all my colleagues from the uh, AMPI working group infection transplant we are in 21 laboratories throughout uh, Italy, north, south, uh, middle and south. And uh, we, we are working every time to, to have a, a good uh, harmonization of the results between all labs, a, a good uh, agreement with the clinicians in order to have a, a good, uh, for, for CMV, a very good uh, virological monitoring. Thank you, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Tiziana, for a very nice talk. 
we will get all the uh, question at the end. Uh, and so we can move to the second talk, which will be given by Martina Sester, which is professor for transplantation and infection, uh, infection immunology. She's an expert in the field of uh, T-cell diagnostics. So the uh, up to you, Martina, to give your talk, please, about when should we use the, uh, all the new immunological tools? Should it be used in routine? Please, Martina. So my topic is CMV-specific immunological monitoring. And these are my conflicts of interest. And I will start off with the pillars of monitoring for CMV complications after transplantation, which are, of course, apart from clinical symptoms, we have CMV-specific antibodies, which are mainly applied in before transplantation for risk assessment. We have uh, all measures of CMV replication, as we just heard from Tiziana, which are mainly applied after transplantation for monitoring complications. And I will now in my talk outline where CMV-specific T cells may be used in clinical routine. And as you can see here from this cartoon, they may have value both before transplantation as well as after transplantation. And I will outline scenarios where that can be used. So as G Tiziana just has mentioned, um, this part is also covered in the international consensus guidelines in the immunology part. And I will refer to these guidelines, which have um, last time met in 2017. And I will um, provide the content of these guidelines as well as update uh, more publications which have appeared since then. So in my talk, I will cover first essays for monitoring specific cellular immunity, and then I will uh, summarize areas of application to improve management of CMV infections after transplantation. So um, for quantification of CMV specific T cells, uh, stimulation based assays are used where stimuli are used either infected cell lysates or antigens or peptides that are taken up by antigen presenting cells in the blood or PBMCs. Those are taken up and processed and presented to T cells that are then activated and produce cytokines, which then can be analyzed um, using so-called interferon gamma release assay because interferon gamma is the most important or most prominent cytokines being released. I also should highlight that um, each specific stimulation is accompanied by negative and positive controls that gives you a general um, outline of how T cells respond in general. So there are three main principles how interferon gamma release can be analyzed after stimulation. On the left, you see a classical ELISA method where, ELI where, where the interferon gamma is analyzed from the supernatants of uh, stimulated cells. You can also use an early spot assay where you plate cells into a, a micro plate and you can then analyze interferon gamma locally captures as spot in the plate. So this looks like that. And finally, there is intracellular cytokine staining using closed cytometry where the cytokines are, uh, are withheld in the cells and then they can be analyzed using fluor fluorescently labeled antibodies in the cells as together with cell surface markers or other um, markers on the cells. So these are the assay principles that are generally used for monitoring specific T cells. So what you have to bear in mind is that a patient always receives immunosuppressive drugs and that has well an effect on specific T cells, both in vivo in the patient, of course, but also in vitro. And that you can also monitor in vitro such as in this work shown here. So if you have a stimulation in the absence of immunosuppressive drugs, you have the maximum amount of cytokines produced. Whereas if the stimulation is carried out in the presence of immunosuppressive drugs, you have a dose dependent decrease in the ability to secrete the cytokine. So these tests are well affected by the immunosuppressive drugs that the patients take. And this can also um, influence outcome of the tests, but also of the patients, of course. 
So these are now the is a, is a key table of the consensus recommendations, and I will guide you now through various scenarios where cellular immunity may be used in a clinical setting. And this can be pre-transplant as well as post-transplant in a prophylactic, prophylactic and preemptive setting and also to guide treatment duration. So first of all, you have to know that if you analyze cellular immunity in an asymptomatic individual, these levels of specific cells as shown here on the left are quite stable over time whereas um, you don't have any specific cells in CMV negative individuals, obviously. So this stability is outlined here. So if you, especially if you stimulate with a lysate, each seropositive individual has specific T cells detectable and they, those are very stable over time in asymptomatic individuals. So this knowledge can be used, first of all, just as an alternative to CMV serology in clinical situations where serology may be falsely, po falsely um, positive, such as in patients who had, have received plasma infusions or also in uh, young infants um, who have, may have passive immunity um, from pregnancy still. So in this situation, we have shown that Cellular immunity is not transferred by plasma infusion or pregnancy, and this can serve as a more accurate parameter to define the actual um, infection status as compared to antibodies in particularly these two situations. So this can serve an, as an alternative to CMV serology. So this is an area of applications where I would say most studies exist, namely a risk assessment after stopping prophylaxis. So this is a cartoon showing the potential scenario. You have uh, the period of prophylaxis. And um, if, if you stop prophylaxis and the patient has sufficient T cell immunity, it's the assumption that viral, virus is well controlled. Whereas if the patient does not have specific immunity, there is risk of primary infection or reactivation in case of a positive individual. So in that study, which has been done using the quantiferon CMV assay, 127 B plus R minus patients have been studied and CMV specific immunity has been determined at the end of prophylaxis and patients have been followed up for development of CMV disease. So what you can see here is if a patient has specific immunity, such as here shown on the left, the likelihood of developing DM CMV disease is very much lower as compared to a patient who is non-reactive in the test. And that can, can either be a negative result or an indeterminate result. So um, this moment of stopping prophylaxis can be a good moment to judge whether specific immunity um, actually um, predicts whether the patient controls the virus or not. A similar study has been done in a multicenter approach this with more patients. And in that study, not only D plus R minus, but also zero positive recipients have been included. And the same setting T cells at the end of prophylaxis were analyzed and patients were followed up for development of CMV disease. And as you can see here, patients who did develop a CMV event after stopping prophylaxis had significantly lower um, spot forming cells now in an early spot uh, towards IE1 and PP65 as compared to patients who did not develop a CMV event. And if you look at that in a, in a Kaplan-Meier curve, um, you see they, the authors did a, a rock analysis to show that spot forming cells above 40 indicated protection. And as you can see here, um, above 40, there was a um, lower likelihood of developing a CMV event. If you now look at the, um, at the individual group, first of all, all patients, this is a highly significant association with a very high negative predictive value. But if you break down the two groups, namely the B plus R minus and the R plus, you see that this this significant effect is mainly driven by R positives, meaning that in the other group, in R, D plus R minus, most of the patients probably have not developed yet 
a CMV specific immunity and are probably not really at risk for further developing a CMV disease or complications. So this is more likely to be useful in positive recipients. And this was in fact uh, the aim of a study of a Spanish study by Oriol Besta. And he in fact studied um, 69 D plus R minus patients, same setting at the end of prophylaxis. And again, uh, patients who subsequently developed infections had significantly lower levels of IE1 and PP65 specific cells. And again, he looked at, um, at the odds ratio for developing um, CMV infections. And if you now look at patients who were PP65 negative and IE1 negative, which he called high risk in his study, you have an odds ratio of 4.3 to develop uh, primary uh, to develop um, CMV reactivation. Whereas if you look at PP65 negatives exclusively, this did not reach statistical significance. And interestingly, the highest predictive value was obtained by looking at patients who are IE1 negative at the end of prophylaxis. Here, the odds ratio was by far highest um, and even higher as compared to the double negatives. So and this is important as the authors used this um, antigen and this cutoff for an interventional randomized trial that I will just present in a minute. So this is an interesting study and all sets of study used um, um, CMV specific monitoring here at the end of prophylaxis. So there are other scenarios where CMV specific monitoring could be used. And this is uh, shown again in a cartoon here. You could also use this in a pre preemptive setting just um, in parallel to looking for viral load. And this is um, work that we have done because we have seen that a decrease in specific immunity and in particular by the shading here symbolized an increase in, in the, a decrease in the functionality of the cells may indicate viral replication. And this is shown here. We have observed, if you look at markers for functional energy on specific cells, you see that patients with reactivation or primary infection have highest level of this marker of functionality, functional energy on specific cells as compared to patients without um, infectious complications. And if you follow that longitudinally, you even see that many patients um, upregulate PD-1 on their CMV specific cells even before viremia develops. So that may serve as a marker for monitoring um, in a preemptive fashion along with viral load. So in the bottom um, cartoon, you see now a scenario where you can use um, CMV specific monitoring for guidance of treatment duration and for predicting potential viral relapse. So if you have a patient that receives antiviral therapy, usually you look for CMV DNA to become negative, but there are always a certain percentage of patients who have a viral relapse as shown here on the right. And it's conceivable to assume that CMV specific T cells developing during uh, antiviral therapy may indicate sustained vir viral control, whereas um, a loss or still an insufficient T cell immunity may uh, predispose for viral relapse. And this has been nicely shown in an in, or analyzed in an interventional trial by a Canadian group, and they have enrolled uh, 32 patients and finally have analyzed 27 for. Um, specific immunity at the end of treatment and 14 had a positive test at the end of treatment and 13 had a negative test. And so with these 13 negatives, they uh, decided to do a secondary prophylaxis and with the 14 positives, they stopped treatment. So what was the outcome of this study? So in the 14 that were positive at the end of prophylaxis, there was only one relapsed 36 days after stopping prophylaxis and this patient had a good response to therapy. 
So in the negatives where secondary prophylaxis was applied, the result was as follows. There, was, there were nine out of 13 patients who had a re relapse despite secondary prophylaxis and two were during prophylaxis, five stopped prophylaxis due to side effects and one had non-compliant and one had a prophylaxis stop uh, and a relapse after stopping secondary prophylaxis. So these data show that secondary prophylaxis did not really help um, CMV infections to or relapse to, um, to, to prevent. But on the other hand, as you can see here, this negative CMV specific assay at the end of the therapy well allowed identification of patients at risk for relapse. So that's one conclusion that can be drawn from this study. So, and finally, this is an, uh, the first interventional trial that has been done in a randomized fashion. And this is again from the Spanish group. And they have analyzed 160 patients, D plus R minus. And based on the study that I just outlined before on where IE1 specific T cells were most predictive for CMV specific reactivation events, they used IE1 specific T cells prior to transplantation at day zero, and then did a randomization strategy in either prophylaxis or preemptive therapy based on low risk at day zero or high risk at day zero, depending on IE1 specific T cells. So I will uh, show you the results in the next slide. What they also did, they looked at CMV specific, IE1 specific T cells at day 15 to see whether that is better predictive as compared to day one, day zero. So the most interesting arms here are the preemptive ones because uh, these are actually the arms where you can see CMV events occurring immediately after transplantation. So what were the results of this study? As you can see here now from IE1 specific T cells at day one, you see clearly that low risk patients so having more than uh, 20 events, uh, spot forming cells, IE1 specific, are less likely to develop CMV infections as compared to high risk patients. And that applies in the preemptive therapy arm as well as in the prophylaxis shown on the right side. So if you now look at not at the day zero, but on IE1 specific T cells at day 15, the results are even more pronounced in distinguishing the two um, risk groups in that in, in the, if you look at day 15, there are more patients losing specific immunity in the first, first 14 days. And that poses another percentage of patients at higher risk for developing CMV complications. And this is why the hazard ratio at day 15 became far more higher as compared to day zero. And this applies to preemptive therapy as well as to prophylaxis. So conclusion from this trial is probably that if you wait for day 15 where the immunosuppression may um, have an effect, then you are even better able to uh, distinguish um, the risk for um, potential development of CMB complications even better than at day zero. So um, before I come to the major conclusions, there are immunosuppressive drugs that may add as additional confounders both to the T cell assays in itself, but also to the patients in that if you, there is a difference between patients that receive ATG as induction therapy as compared to IL-2 receptor antibodies in that re results in a quantitative decrease in the first weeks after transplantation. I sh I've shown you that especially calcineurin inhibitors decreases T cell functionality. So that decreases CMI. And on the other hand, mTOR inhibitors have, shown, have been shown to act both as a direct antiviral activity. And they also have shown to be immunomodulatory. And there is one study that we have recently performed. And this is part of an Athena sub-study 
And as you can see here in this sub-study, the Evarolimus treated patients did not have any CMV complications as compared to the third arm of MPA and TAC. And if we look for specific immunity in these arms, you don't see any, in it, any difference in the levels of specific immunity at month 12, but well in the functionality in that the patients who had highest amount of infectious complications had um, highest levels of CTLA-4 as marker of functional energy. So this illustrates that immunosuppressive drugs may well alter this um, balance between or, or alter the predictive value of these tests. So in summary, I've shown you that CMV-specific cellular immunity may be quantified for use in a clinical setting. T cells may be used as alternative to antibodies to define prior infection. Quantitative or qualitative T cell characteristics may inform on the risk for infection and or disease. So in conclusion, potential areas of application in clinical practice include correct assignment of CMV infection status in individuals with potential passive immunity. I've shown you scenarios where early identifications of patients at risk is possible in a preemptive setting or to assign prophylaxis or preemptive therapy on an individual basis or after prophylaxis. And it can finally also be used to guide treatment duration. So if I come back to my initial slide and would like to answer the question, is it time for routine application? I would say yes because it can serve as an adjunct tool to further individualize CMV management strategy, although it should at present at least always uh, be used in conjunction with uh, viral load assays. So with that, I would like to finish and thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Martina, for this very nice talk and very, uh, thank you very much also uh, to um, Tiziana for the very nice talk. I think we have some time for some few questions. I think Luciano will start. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Nassim. And again, thank you. I wish also to thank uh, Mar Martina and, and Tiziana. Uh, the, uh, all the attendees are free to, um, to, ask, uh, answer, to ask uh, questions in the Q&A. Uh, logo uh, underneath. We have already uh, one or two, and then we will discuss this also with the with the panel. I have a, a, a question for uh, Tiziana. Uh, you showed us nicely the uh, different kinetics uh, and the slope of uh, whole blood and plasma uh, CMV DNA, and and you concluded that uh, the um, the blood CMV DNA is more precise because it can respond more quickly to, uh, to the therapy. But uh, uh, how about the uh, prediction of relapse? Because if you follow the whole blood, you stop your treatment earlier. And if you follow the plasma, you stop your treatment later. This is what I got from your presentation. But is there any difference in the risk of, uh, of relapse? Uh, regarding which of the two assay you follow. Yes, uh, thank you for the question, Luciano. And uh, just uh, in uh, the LAX experience, uh, when we analyzed the, the um, we compared whole blood and plasma in a kidney and organ transplant, in the group uh, uh, who we observed uh, are very um, a very strict decline of the DNA in uh, whole blood uh, in comparison to plasma sample, we did not observe uh, uh, any relapse. On the contrary, in the other group, uh, when uh, uh, we recognize a very long decline of the DNA in plasma, we observed that three, uh, in three patients, uh, uh, every time the, the, uh, some relapses. So probably uh, we are in agree, we are agree, uh, sorry, we, uh, we agree with the Canadian group that in plasma, in most cases, in, uh, they demonstrated that in 90% of cases uh, in plasma, the DNA is uh, only 
fragmented uh, molecule and not associated with the uh, variants. This is uh, an important information. And uh, the Canadian group analyzed the uh, only um, active viral replication and analyzed the samples, the plasma sample, and uh, demonstrated that in most cases, because 90% of cases, very high the percentage, is not DNA associated with variants. And probably during the therapy, preemptive therapy with the gancyclovir, vicancyclovir in our patients, the very slow uh, decline of the DNA is, uh, the, this DNA was only fragmented DNA, not a complete molecule. Thank you, Tiziana. And I have a, 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 a very short question for Martina. I think that you convinced uh, us all uh, regarding the importance of semi-immune monitoring. But how about the assays? So we know that there are some out there. Uh, there is any clinical evidence of one better than the other? Or what, do, do we have any room for any recommendation? So um, I guess this is also some area of further research because um, although, for example, the early spots use the same antigens, um, one commercially available brand uses complete antigens and the other one uses peptides. So it may be assumed that the results are the same, but um, finally this should also be, be um, standardized for each assay, so the applications. Or for example, what I showed in the beginning, the, the potential uh, use as alternative to serology. This is particularly useful if you use the lysate where basically all seropositives react. So that wouldn't necessarily work with a commercial bondiferon or, or the um, early spot assays. So in, in principle, it needs to be, uh, the, the areas need to be uh, defined for each test, basically. Martina, I have a question. Before moving to the questions from the participants, I have one question for you. And the study you presented regarding patients undergoing preemptive therapy, you showed us that the, the T cell immune response can decrease before the increase of viremia, isn't it? Yes. So, in this, is... case, so in this case, how often should we check for the T cell immunity since we are, it's uh, recommended to do the viremia once a week? So should it be done also weekly or more often? So if you do it in that setting, it would be most reasonable, reasonable to use it just at the same time points as viremia to see whether um, if a virus gets detectable, if specific immunity is competent enough to control that and whether you can wait before applying antiviral um, therapy. So that's the idea or that would be the idea in that setting. Okay. So we have one question from the participant. The question is, I understand that the monitoring of cellular immunity after prophylaxis is not, not useful to decide prolongation of prophylaxis in R minus patients, and they had not even been exposed to CMV, but it's useful in R plus patients only. Do you agree, Martina? Yes, I would agree. That is exactly my personal conclusion. I would draw from that as well, because um, as we all know, the, uh, a lot of D plus R minus, um, they fortunately never develop disease. So that would mean um, they don't have a specific immunity at the end of prophylaxis. And that would mean basically to treat them indefinitely, which doesn't make sense. So, um, so in fact, the positive predictive value from that is in fact very low in these scenarios and the negative predicted value decreases also in the D plus R minus. But on the other hand, as the, the um, person who asked that question outlined um, in the R plus, it does make sense because if you don't, if you have lost for some reason specific immunity by the end of prophylaxis, this may indicate a higher risk for reactivation. 
Okay. Thank so thank the you. same the same participant is asking another question, always for you, Martina. So what is the lead time gained by testing cellular immunity to detect viremia early? What is the lead time? Okay. Um, so um, it that's a good question. I mean, it we we did see patients uh, that actually did develop um, viremia after the loss of specific immunity, and there you could just um, earlier apply antiviral therapy. So um, this is a well, this is in fact a good question because this, this may differ from one patient to the other, yeah. And if you consider that, um, well, you on, on one hand may um, prevent CMV infections from occurring at all. On the other hand, um, yeah, you, you, are, you may just be earlier as compared to viral load monitoring alone. Yeah, but we can also consider perhaps that uh, that we can uh, decrease immunosuppression before vi viremia occurs. If you have a reduction in T cell immunity, perhaps we can reduce a little bit the immunosuppression during the week before the occurrence of viremia. Yeah, that's that's also a good point. Yeah, Luciano. Yes, uh, thank you, Martina. I would also now uh, I would like to introduce the uh, the panel of uh, uh, discussant here, uh, uh, Professor Fausto Baldanti, Professor Fauzi Saliba, and Professor Paolo Grossi, who uh, is the chair of the uh, ISOT CMV working group. And uh, I would like to involve them also in, in one of the questions that we received from the audience. Uh, that can be linked also to the uh, to the presentation that we heard uh, here. Nathan Dees is asking: After three weeks of uh, valgan uh, 900 milligrams BID, CMV DNA became borderline from uh, 20,000 20, copies. So it started 20,000, then it goes borderline. Uh, what should do? So probably is asking. Shall we go on until it's completely zero, or we can accept a borderline uh, uh, value? I think that there are several um, implications here regarding the testing, the immunity, and the other issues. So, yes, I think that according to what, to what Tiziana was uh, uh, showing us, uh, so it depends from what method was detected. Uh, the borderline positivity, if it was plasma, I would feel confident in stopping the antiviral. If it is all blood, I usually prefer to have at least two negative uh, uh, samples before stopping uh, uh, treatment because the, the dosage that they are using is for treatment. So I'm really surprised that 20,000 uh, copies uh, uh, are associated with any significant CMV disease. This is not my experience. Well, maybe to add a little bit on that, uh, if you could run an Elispot assay at that time, you might uh, maybe uh, discover that the patient has a good enough response to control the infection. So that level, that uh, borderline level could be just expression of released DNA from a deep side of infection that was sold. So in that case, if you have a doubt uh, on uh, continuing or stopping, that is one case where the early spot or the T-cell immunity can really help you in the sign. If, if I may... <coughs> Uh, make a comment to the uh, findings of, of Martina because uh, I agree that with prophylaxis uh, probably in, uh, uh, in the high risk population so in the CV seronegative maybe is not that helpful but uh, I use preemptive uh, uh, approach from many many years and what I see and what I do is I, I use the uh, specific T-cell immunity 
to decide uh, once I have I stop the preemptive approach, so in patients who are asymptomatic are treated because they reach the threshold, and I, I check for the, the T cell uh, immunity with that spot I sent to Fauto Badanti the samples, and uh, and I, I found. Uh, positive, uh, so with, with a good immunity, and, and in fact, I, I do stop uh, uh, the, the treatment, I monitor the patient, and I don't see any relapse, uh, and in others, when there is no or very low T-cell, specific T-cell immunity, I continue monitoring, monitoring closely the, this patient, because they may relapse, so I think that the, uh, prophylaxis has an impact in the development of uh, specific uh, T cell uh, immune. This was demonstrated many years ago in the stem cell transplant by the group of Seattle. And so I think that the prophylactic approach, at least with, with the cancycloid or bicancycloid, may have a negative impact uh, in developing a specific T cell immunity. I just want to know your, your thought on, on this. Yeah, I totally agree. So that this is also a, a, a good way of using these tests, not just um, all the time in parallel with viral load monitoring, but just as a decision, as a help for deciding when to stop closer monitoring. So um, I agree that this is, this is a very good um, area of application. We have, it, it's basically similar to the study that I showed uh, by Depali Kumar, um, who just did this interventional trial to uh, see whether in that case um, further treatment or prolongation of treatment could uh, prevent some um, reactivations from occurring or relapses. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so this is just another step towards individualized um, management. Maybe, maybe one hour is. has passed. I have there are there is still one short question before stopping. Uh, the question is when the T cell immunity is uh, low before transplantation. Martina, do you suggest modifying the strategy and using mTOR inhibitors? This is a good question. Um, it could in fact um, be immunomodulatory, yeah, that it, it can probably boost specific immunity, not necessarily in a CMV zero negative, but if you have a CMV zero positive that has a low specific immunity, that could be one way of um, probably having a benefit apart from probably also using a prophylaxis regimen in that case. Uh, did you check uh, the um, uh, T cell immune response in patients on Belatacept? There are some emerging data on some severe and more resistant CMV infection in patients received given uh, Belatacept. We haven't checked ourselves because, uh, yeah, I cannot say, but um, I would assume that that you should be cautious, such a, a similar as in the situation with EBV primary infection because it may be um, difficult in patients who may have a CMV primary infection because Belatacept may prevent um, or just impair the proper development of primary immunity towards <coughs> the virus and that can be deleterious. Okay. Luciano for the conclusion. Yes, thank you, thank you, Nassim. Uh, we uh, we reached uh, the the hour of this webinar, and we had uh, during the presentation more than one hundred attendees, and uh, uh, at about eighty, uh, more than eighty participants up to now. So thank you everybody for your interest, and thank you all the speakers and the and the panelists. And also wish to thanks once again, uh, MST uh, who supported this, uh, this webinar uh, with an unrestricted grant. Uh, I also uh, would like to invite everybody to uh, register for the ESOT TLJ 2.0, who's gonna uh, be held in November 15 to 17, as you can see here. 
and it's uh, an online completely new experience uh, to learn about uh, CMV and other uh, important issues in transplantation. So please visit uh, ESOT website to learn more about the ESOT TLJ 2.0. And uh, um, we uh, are looking for ways to improve our educational platform. So if you have any comments, please uh, uh, send us an email to here to this uh, 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 email address I to the um, questions that is coming up uh, right now, which is a questions needed for the uh, webinar. So please uh, uh, answer this poll. We have other up to 30 seconds, 35 seconds to wait. I think that, okay, it has been uh, useful. I think most of you found it useful or extremely useful. So I thank you for your positive comments. And uh, I uh, uh, wish, uh, wish you all uh, a very good evening and thank again all the participants to this uh, uh